What shall we render to the Lord for all his bounty to us? We will offer to the Lord the sacrifices of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Gracious God, for revealing yourself to us as one who created all things, who gave us dominion over all the earth, who called us into a covenant relationship with you, who has given us the privilege of being your ambassadors in our world, who loves us as your children through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you our heartfelt thanks. our Savior, because you were willing to come to earth in the likeness of humanity, to take the form of a servant, because you became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, because God has highly exalted you and bestowed on you the name which is above every name, that at your name every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We humbly bow before you in praise and adoration. dwelling within us and calling us to God by the gospel, for preserving us in the true faith, for leading the church on earth in its mission, for pointing the way of discipleship to each of us. We acknowledge our presence and power among us. Jesus said, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. We hear your call to discipleship. Master, teach us the way we should go. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit, and that your fruit should abide. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let us join together in prayer as we confess our sins. We confess, Lord, that as your disciples, we have often dishonored the holy name we bear. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we have failed to labor for your kingdom, when we have not followed your admonition to seek first the kingdom of God, when we have hidden our light from the world when we, as the salt of the earth, have lost our strength. Have mercy on us and restore unto us the joy of faithful discipleship. Amen. The Lord, your Redeemer, has said, with everlasting love I will have compassion on you. Therefore serve the Lord with gladness. Witness to his goodness and mercy and preach Jesus Christ as Lord with yourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Today is John 1 verses 43 to 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Messiah and said to him, 
We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Messiah said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathalia coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathalia said to him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathalia replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? Will you see greater things than these? And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Thus ends our reading today.
Acts, there's a passage in which Agrippa is listening to Paul. Paul has been brought before Agrippa. Uh, he has been accused of being a follower of Jesus and of promoting this, what was uh, then a new religion within the Roman Empire. And Agrippa says to Paul, would you so quickly make of me a Christian? What was Agrippa talking about? What is a Christian? What does that word mean? What should it mean? Would Jesus even have wanted us to be labeled as Christians? After all, this is the one of whom Paul said, Jesus, though he was the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. So I return to the question, what is a Christian? I think it's really important that we reflect on this for ourselves, that we come to some sort of understanding that we can articulate to others about what it means to us to be a Christian. Because if we don't do that, and if we don't communicate it um, in our friendships, in our conversations across the web, like on this YouTube presentation, if we don't do that, then people outside the community of faith uh, not our co-religionists, but others will define for themselves what it means to be a Christian. And we might find that their definition of what it means to be a Christian is at odds with our own self-understanding of what it means to be Christian. So we need to reflect upon this and we need then to uh, convey to the rest of the world what we believe it means to be a Christian. And I think this morning's passage that we heard this morning um, Jesus' call to Philip and to Nathaniel is a good place for us to start to clarify what it means to be a Christian. Um, and I've already sort of revealed what I think about it uh, in what I've already said. To borrow language from playing cards, I've revealed my hands. Because I believe that being a Christian is to follow Christ. It is to say yes to God's call in Christ and follow him. I want to look then at this passage this morning and examine it more carefully. When Jesus goes to Galilee and he calls Philip, I believe that his words when he speaks to Philip are very significant. Significantly, he says, follow me, follow me. He doesn't say, worship me. He doesn't say, join my religion. Uh, he doesn't say, promote my personal brand. Don't, uh, he doesn't say, promote my worldview. No, Jesus says, follow me. To be a Christian then, I understand, is to embark upon a journey of faith following Jesus. And this journey of faith proceeds along a narrow path. The path is much more like the paths that shepherds would take their sheep and goats along in the Holy Land rather than the broad Roman roads. This path is a path that is narrow. It is easy to fall off the path. It is easy to succumb to temptations or weariness and leave the trail. Jesus says that the path to salvation is narrow, but the pathway to destruction is broad. But significantly, there are as many on-ramps to this path as there are opportunities for falling off. And so we can, or others can, pick us up and put us back on that path so that we can continue our journey of following Jesus Christ, of being a Christian. As the early 15th century Christian theologian and devotional writer Thomas Kempis noted, to follow Jesus is to imitate Jesus. It is to model our lives after the life of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus is to cultivate the fruits of God's Spirit in our own lives. It is to promote in the lives of others and ourselves love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and self-control. That's Paul's list from Galatians 5.22, a good summary of the sort of the fruits of the Spirit that we develop from following Jesus Christ. To follow Jesus Christ is to do what Jesus 
said to Peter, uh, following Peter's denial, Jesus' resurrection from the grave, Peter uh, came to him. Jesus forgave him after uh, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus does this three times. It's believed that that three times of asking Peter these questions is a way of erasing or um, compensating for Peter's uh, threefold denial of Christ before the rooster crowed um, on that day when Jesus was convicted and died. So Jesus wipes out Peter's um, apostasy, Peter's denial of him by asking him three times, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And significantly, what Jesus then tells Peter to do is to feed his lambs, to tend his sheep, to look out for those for whom Jesus himself was concerned. So to follow Jesus is to care for Jesus' sheep. It is to care for others within the family of faith, but also those who are outside the family of faith who also are God's children. To follow Jesus, to be a Christian, is to be for justice combined with grace. It is to be for righteousness combined with opportunities for reconciliation and redemption. It is to do, as we read in Micah, justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. To follow Jesus is to follow Jesus' commandments. It is to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. It is to love our neighbor as ourselves. It is to return good for evil. It is to turn the other cheek in the face of violence. It is to serve God, God's creation, and humanity. We would do well to remember our Lord's words. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Fortunately, we have among us, and there have been those who have gone before us, examples of Christian service. On this Sunday, we recognize the contributions and live witnesses of members of this congregation who are also part of the International Order of the King's Daughters and Sons. This is an international organization dedicated to service in Christ's name. Its aim is not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And you will recognize that as the King James Version of the passage I just shared with you earlier. It's Mark 10, verse 45. I want to share with you a hymn that normally would be sung in church on this Sunday. The title of the hymn is To Bind Earth's Broken Hearts. To Bind Earth's Broken Hearts. And it speaks to me about what the essence is of being a Christian, of responding yes to Jesus' invitation, follow me. Here it is. To bind earth's broken hearts and sore. To tread the way Christ walked before. To know thee better, serve thee more, we take thy cross, our Lord and King. To help the, rear, the weary to thy rest, to heal and comfort earth's distressed, to show the world we love thee best, we wear thy cross, our Lord and King. A king's daughter or a king's son is a Christian, one who, when hearing Jesus say, follow me, has answered, yes, and so serves as a living witness to our Lord and Savior. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the notable things about responding to God's call and saying yes is that we can never be sure where that call is going to come from. We can never be sure of the messenger who is bearing God's call. About a year ago, I received a manila envelope, and it was addressed to me from the Eastern District of the Moravian Church, Northern Province, so I knew that it contained a call. I just didn't know where the call was to, where I was going to serve. And I opened it up, and I soon discovered that I had been called to serve as your pastor here at Nazareth Moravian Church. And immediately in the process of free association, I thought of this morning's passage of Scripture. Why? 
Well, first and foremost, because the passage of Scripture is about a call. It is about a call of God, and it's about an unexpected call of God. In our scripture passage this morning, Nathaniel is wondering that Jesus is Messiah, the one who calls him, can come from Nazareth. And notoriously, he says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And we might wonder why he had this view, not of Nazareth, Pennsylvania, of course, but of Nazareth and Galilee. Why was Nathaniel so down on little Nazareth? And what can his question teach us about how we should or should not respond to the inbreaking of God's grace, to God's call in our lives? I think it is important for us to step back and realize that in Jesus' day, in Nathaniel's day, in Philip's day, in that first century, Nazareth was so small and so insignificant that it doesn't merit a mention in any book other than our Bible. It reminds me of those small towns that I knew growing up in North Carolina before the population boom and all the development. Towns that were marked by one stoplight or even no stoplights. Towns that if you blinked while you were driving through, you could easily miss. Many of these were unincorporated. They're no longer on the maps. Uh, indeed, some of them were never on the maps. And Nazareth apparently was such a town in the first century. It was a small, insignificant town. In other words, it's not the sort of town that Nathaniel an Israelite in whom there is no deceit, according to our Lord, would have looked for the coming of God's Messiah. It was off the radar. But I fear there's also an element of social prejudice in Nathaniel's statement, his question. Um, and that is that people from the urban areas, people from Jerusalem, where there was a greater influx of outsiders, a greater flow of information, a greater flow of, of uh, conversation about differing viewpoints, deem themselves more uh, educated and more cosmopolitan than what they saw as the rustic bumpkins in little villages like Nazareth. So there was a looking down on these people from the perspective of power in the capital of Jerusalem and in those big cities that the uh, Roman Empire had helped establish. Now, I think it would be... Um, a mistake for us to directly put this onto the 21st century. The temptation, of course, is for those of us in small towns like Nazareth, Pennsylvania, to think that um, what we should draw from this is that God is on our side, that God is coming from our midst, and that those people in those big cities like Pittsburgh or Philadelphia are looking down on us, and perhaps they are, but that's not what I believe the point of this scripture passage is. And I believe that if we use the scripture passage in that way, that what we're doing is abusing it. We're using scripture to support our own view, to support our own insecurities, rather than using scripture to open our eyes to see what spiritual truths are there. And I believe the spiritual truth is that we all are blinded by preconceptions, by our notions of who it is that God can work through and who it is significantly that God does not work through. So um, while the people in Jerusalem may have thought that God was not going to work through those folks out at Nazareth, it's equally possible that the folks in Nazareth were thinking that God wasn't going to work through those people in Jerusalem. Um, today, the danger is that we think that God is on our side. We think that God is for us and that God is not working through all those people. Notice that Jesus does not condemn Nathaniel. Jesus doesn't come back and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with Nazareth. Rather, he says, here is, here is a Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel comes out, he states what his, his prejudice is. It's out there in the open. But significantly, his prejudice is proven wrong. It is without basis, without grounding. Good things do come out of Nazareth. Our Lord and Savior called Nazareth and Galilee his hometown. Good things do come out of Nazareth, Pennsylvania. We knew that. 
We've seen that with the work of the King's Daughters, particularly the Bright Stars uh, group here at Nazareth Moravian Church, and in all the wonderful ministries of service that come out of this congregation. The point is that when we look at God's call, when we consider God's call to ourselves and to others, we never should prejudge others. God can work through whoever God pleases. And in order to see that, in order to realize that God might come to us, even from those who we believe are most opposed to our worldview, we have to adopt as our own two more virtues that are characteristic of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's another step, if you will, in our journey to come and to follow him. And those virtues are humility and grace. Jesus had the humility to come and to serve others. And he had the grace that when people such as Philip misjudged him, when they spoke with prejudice and unaware of what the truth was, that he could forgive them, that he could reach out to them in relationship and bring them in that relationship closer to God so that walking alongside of them on the road to wherever it was they were going, he and they could draw one step at a time closer to the truth. Isn't it interesting as they were journeying together moving closer to the truth, that in that journey, they were walking with the one who was the way, who was the truth, who was the life. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who follows the way, the truth, and the life. A Christian is one who follows Jesus Christ, our Lord, and makes imitation of his Lord and Savior, his life's purpose.